Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. John Ward, Director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health um, in Atlanta. Uh, I also uh, have a, an appointment with the National Cancer Institute at NIH, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to our um, uh, this, this version of our NIH webinar series, where we'll be looking at research of hepatitis B virus and related disease in the United States coming from the um, NIDDK Hepatitis B Research Network. Um, next slide. This is part of a um, um, webinar series that we started uh, several years ago. This is our <clears throat> third year. We're looking at uh, research that can help us accelerate progress toward uh, reaching goals for elimination of hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus transmission um, and disease. Um, the coalition does this in collaboration with uh, the various uh, NIH uh, institutes and offices. Uh, all the information about the webinars and all the information coming from the webinars are available at the coalition website at globalhep.org. I'm going to thank uh, the uh, organizing committee members, as are shown yeah. here, that help bring uh, these um, webinars uh, together. We've had um, a, a rich um, content from a variety of different areas uh, throughout the NIH, and I encourage you to go in and look at those if you not have been following the series up to this point. And I think this uh, webinar today will, will be no exception in the quality of content um, and speakers. Um, just to, to get you oriented to the webinar, uh, uh, we encourage questions. Please uh, submit your questions to the Q&A um, section of, um, on, the, on the Zoom uh, broadcast uh, website, uh, um, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, refer those either verbally to the speakers or we'll encourage them to comment on them uh, uh, written uh, in form after their uh, in, uh, after their presentation is completed. Uh, the webinars are recorded and they're available on our website, as I mentioned, as are the slide presentations and a synthesis uh, of the various reports will also be developed and available uh, there. Um, and please continue to sign up for our uh, webinars and so you can be uh, uh, notified of, of future webinars in this series. Uh, and then others from the coalition. Um, today, uh, this presents the agenda uh, that we'll be going through. As you can see, we have uh, truly an all-star cast of um, some of the, the leading experts uh, in hepatitis B uh, globally. Uh, it's my pleasure to be um, convening this webinar with my uh, long-standing colleague, Dr. Jay Hoofnagel from NIDDK, and I'll turn it over to Jay to uh, to open this webinar. Jay? Yes, thank you, Dr. Ward. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to sponsor this webinar on results from the Hepatitis B Research Network we call the HBRN. It's a cooperative agreement that was funded by NIDDK. And the aims of the network were to provide a, 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 better, to buy a better definition of the current natural history and outcomes of hepatitis B in the United States, including both acute and chronic disease. We, the, another aim was to assess uh, the controversies in therapy with clinical trials. The network was initiated in 2008, and it's uh, now coming to a, con a conclusion in the last next couple of months. What you will hear today is just some of the results um, the uh, not all there. The network has published over fifty manuscripts from its uh, its various studies and ancillary study uh, and ancillary studies. So we'll hear the major findings from the natural history cohort study by Anna Locke, a summary of the results of the ancillary study on acute hepatitis B from Dr. Will Lee, and. Uh, the results of the very ambitious large randomized controlled trial of therapy of hepatitis B from Dr. Uh, Nora Teralt. There will be, uh, each talk will be for 20 minutes and then we'll have a five minute, very short question and answer period after each talk. At the end of all three, we will have a 30 minute uh, group panel discussion with our three panelists that are shown here. And we'll, I'll introduce people 
uh, right before each of the presentations. So with that background, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anna Locke, probably well known to all, almost all of you. She is professor of medicine and director of clinical hepatology at the University of Michigan uh, School of Medicine. She is the former president of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, the AASLD. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has been a principal investigator on many of our NIDDK clinical networks, including the HALT-C trial. She, is, she was the chair and the lead principal investigator on the HBRN. Dr. Locke will summarize the major results from the HBRN cohort study. Dr. Locke. Well, thank you very much, um, Jay, um, for the introduction. And thank you also, um, Dr. Watt, um, for um, the uh, opportunity to present our results. Um, so I hope that um, you can um, see my screen and um, I will. Okay. Um, so um, as um, Dr. Hufnago um, mentioned, I'll be presenting a major clinical outcomes. These are my financial disclosures. So the Hepatitis B Research Network consists of 13 consortium, 21 adult and seven pediatric sites. Most of them in the United States, but we also included one center in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we did two observational studies with similar protocols in adults and children and three clinical trials, one in immune tolerant, antigen positive um, children and adults um, and one um, in um, immune active um, adults. And there were 30 ancillary studies. So I would focus on the adult cohort study. Uh, and a key criteria for entry would be someone who's hepatitis B service antigen with no history of decompensation, liver cancer, or liver transplantation. And at a time of enrollment, they would not be receiving antiviral therapy unless they are co-infected with Delta infection or they were pregnant. After the initial enrollment and data collection, um, they were seen again at week 12 and then every 24 weeks thereafter. At each visit, we asked um, them questions. So we have patients complete surveys and we provide standard of care because this was an observational study. And the standard of care also includes um, liver cancer surveillance as well as antiviral therapy um, if indicated. All the outcomes were predefined and adjudicated by a committee. So this is the location of all these um, clinical centers of HBRN. I would focus on the clinical outcomes and a major clinical outcome, as you would expect, would include decompensation, liver cancer, liver transplant, or hepatitis B related death. Majority of the patients did not have cirrhosis and enrollment. So we were also interested in knowing whether any patient developed incident cirrhosis during the course of follow-up. This will be determined either by histology or in the absence of histology by imaging criteria and low platelet count. Chronic hepatitis B is characterized by ALT flares. So we were also interested in looking at flares, which is defined as ALT more than 10 times upper li limit of normal, with 30 um, being the criteria for cutoff for men and 20 for women. As I've mentioned, these patients were not receiving antiviral treatment at enrollment, and we wanted to know how often patients were started on treatment per standard of care and looking at e-antigen loss and s antigen loss as well. Of the 2,000 or so uh, participants enrolled, um, we selected the following for the outcome analysis. These were all adults with chronic hepatitis B. You'll hear later on that some of the patients come in with acute hepatitis B. So this analysis focused on those with chronic hepatitis B, no HIV, hepatitis C, or Delta co-infection, not receiving antiviral treatment at enrollment and not started on treatment during the first 24 weeks. They were not pregnant in enrollment. Because we're interested in long-term outcomes, they need to have at least one follow-up visit more than 24 weeks after enrollment. So in total, we had about 1,400 participants median age of 41, roughly half of them were women. Um, despite the fact that this is a North American study, majority of these patients were Asians, but 13% were Blacks and 10% white. Most of these patients were Yenogen negative, only a quarter of them were Yenogen positive at enrollment, and median HPV DNA was low because these patients are not on antiviral treatment, 
because they were predominantly Asians. So genotypes B and C predominate, um, but we did have 17% genotype A and 7% genotype D and a very um, small proportion of genotype E. The requirement for not on antiviral therapy means that very few patients have cirrhosis at enrollment. Well, what about the HBV phenotypes? Um, very few immune tolerant because of the somewhat older age of these participants, only 4%, 17% yantrum positive immune active, 18% yantrum negative immune active, 24% inactive carriers, 37% in determinant. This is not necessarily representative of chronic hepatitis B patients we see in clinical practice, but representative of um, patients not receiving antiviral treatment at a time of enrollment. So in general, less cirrhosis, less active disease. So we had roughly five to six years of median follow-up with a total of more than 6,000 person year of follow-up. And you can see that very few patients had major clinical outcomes. Only 26 of the 1,400 participants had outcomes, and that included instant cirrhosis. Most of these um, patients um, were not on antiviral therapy. Only five of them had started antiviral therapy at a time of outcome. Some of them were initially yantrin positive, but had lost yantrin by the time of outcome. But none of the patients had outcome who lost service antigen had outcome. As one would expect, majority of the outcomes occur in patients with cirrhosis. So of the small number, 21 based on cirrhosis, four major outcomes occur. Three were liver cancer and one died. Of the roughly 1,400 with no baseline cirrhosis, there were only four of them with major outcomes. Two liver cancer, two decompensation, though 18 of them did meet criteria for instant cirrhosis. So in total, there were eight participants with either decompensation or liver cancer. Um, and as um, is the case with chronic hepatitis B, most of these outcomes occur in men, a little older. Surprisingly, um, actually more of them occur in Caucasians, even though Caucasians only accounted for roughly 10% of the study population. So this actually helps you sort of see this more clearly total 1,400, baseline cirrhosis 21, um, and most of the outcomes occur in those 21 patients. Of this large cohort without baseline cirrhosis, um, there were very few outcomes, only two cancer, one decompensation, 19 had um, incident cirrhosis, one actually had decompensation at that time. So overall, there were very few HPV-related death, one, two, and three in total. Uh, this shows some um, time to event of the major outcomes. Um, again, most of this occurred in a group of baseline cirrhosis, 16% by year four. In those of no baseline cirrhosis, um, by year four, only 0.2%, and even by year seven, um, less than 1% had major outcome. Now, if we include instant cirrhosis, um, then the event rate was a lot higher, 2% um, at year seven. We were also interested in ALT flare, which can sometimes be potentially serious. And indeed, 83 um, patients had ALT flare and cumulative percentage at year seven was 8%, somewhat lower than one would expect. Um, the associated factors, so the people who have flares tend to be younger, yantrum positive, more likely to have cirrhosis, higher DNA, higher quantitative surface antigen, and higher ALT, and lower platelet. Well, why did we see so few outcomes? Well, that's because even though these patients were not on treatment and entry, many of them during the course of follow-up did start treatment. Um, nearly 300 of them started treatment per standard of care. Um, and now, an additional 111 um, that were enrolled into clinical trials, although they were censored at the time of entry. So in total, roughly 400 of them did start treatment along the way. And cumulative percentage by year seven of starting treatment, percent of care was nearly 30%. As you would expect, um, yantrum positive, cirrhosis, higher DNA, higher ALT were associated with starting treatment. Well, Asian patients are more likely to start treatment 
largely because they were more often reagent positive with higher DNA. Well, what about reagent loss? We did observe um, roughly a third of the reagent positive patients lost reagent. So by year seven, in fact, um, almost half of them. Interestingly, most of the reagent loss actually occurs spontaneously and not as a result of treatment. And associated factors included older age, genotype A, lower DNA, and lower quantitative surface energy. Loss of surface energy is something that we had always hoped for, and indeed we do observe that. Um, 90 of the, um, of the 1300 patients who have follow-up testing lost surface energy, again, majority of them spontaneously and not through antiviral treatment. An accumulated percentage by year seven was 12%. Associated factors include older age, men, non-Asians, Yangen negative, lower DNA, and lower quantitative service engine to get a normal ALT. So essentially, they were older inactive carriers um, and non-Asians that were more likely to lose service energy. So overall, in this part of the analysis, we found a low instance of clinical outcomes in a contemporary cohort of chronic hepatitis B patients not receiving antiviral treatment. This actually should be 18% um, per year um, over four years. So most, of, um, no, actually no, not receiving antiviral treatment. So it's actually um, on, um, less than 1%. So most outcomes occur in patients with cirrhosis and no outcome occur after service engine loss. Well, why do we have favorable outcomes? I think it's because of the low percentage of cirrhosis or active disease. Um, and um, a high percentage starting antiviral therapy during follow-up. We conclude that early diagnosis, linkage to care, close monitoring, and treatment initiation when indicated can prevent adverse outcomes and treatment upon diagnosis may not be necessary for all patients. So that's really highlighting the importance of um, treatment overall. Now, one of the things that we were interested in because HBRN included a diverse racial ethnic group, and we know that chronic hepatitis B disproportionately affects persons of Asian or African descent. And Asian Americans and African Americans have higher incidence and early onset of XCC than white persons. We wonder whether this is due to racial differences or differences in duration of infection, HBV genotypes, or social determinants of health or access to treatment. So we analyze whether treatment initiation and outcomes differ between black, Asian, and white participants. And for this, we included adults um, with data on self-declared race, chronic hepatitis B with no HIV, hepatitis C, or Delta co-infection with follow-up for at least some 24 weeks. Um, and we define treatment initiation, um, including those who started treatment per standard of care as well as receiving treatment through HBR and trials. We we'll also look at concordance between starting treatment and treatment eligibility, because currently we do not recommend treating every patient with chronic hepatitis B. And we use the 2016 ASLD guidance document. Um, so we look at some cirrhosis. Um, everyone with cirrhosis, regardless of ALT or HBV DNA, we said treatment will be indicated. Among patients without cirrhosis, it would be antigen positive, DNA more than 20,000, and ALT more than two times upper limit, limit of normal. For antigen negative patients, the DNA cutoff will be more than 2,000. And we look at concordance of treatment initiation and treatment eligibility. So that would be all the patients with cirrhosis. And for patients without cirrhosis, those who meet guidance criteria on two consecutive occasions, as well as when they meet criteria uh, on the first time. So for this analysis, we had done 1,500 participants, not 12% Blacks, 75% Asians, 10% White. We found differences between these three major racial groups. Black participants had lower education level, income, and proportion being employed. And Black and Asian participants were more likely to be foreign born and uninsured or have public insurance. The black participants were more likely to be antigen negative. Um, and among those who are antigen negative to have lower DNA than the Asian participants. Um, so 
I'm showing you a few social criteria uh, between the African Americans, the Asian Americans, and the white. You can see that at, at, for the education level, um, those who had only high school or lower education level were more common in blacks and Asians than in the white. And blacks um, had um, lower income. Um, more of them were, uh, less of them were being fully employed. Less of them, um, less uh, blacks and Asians had private insurance. And of course, the blacks and the Asians uh, were less often born in North America. So there are definite social differences. So what happens to the outcome? Well, as far as treatment is concerned overall, roughly a third of them started treatment during the course of follow-up. And if you look at the cohort as a whole, the Blacks were less likely to start on treatment. The Asians were most likely to start on treatment. But that's because of differences in meeting criteria for ASLD guidelines to start treatment. The Blacks being more likely to negative low DNA, only 14% would meet those treatment criteria compared to 22% in Asians and 27% in white. And if you look at people who met criteria for starting treatment, um, there was actually no difference across the three racial groups. Not surprisingly, those who got started on treatment tend to have higher ALT, higher DNA, more likely to have cirrhosis, and more often were men. And neither race nor socioeconomic factors were significantly associated with treatment initiation once we adjust for these viral or disease some factors. So when we look at everyone, regardless of what, whether they meet, meet treatment criteria, uh, the black participants had lower rates of treatment initiation. But once we focus our attention to those who meet criteria, we found no difference whether we start counting when they met criteria on consecutive occasion or on the first time. There was no difference across the racial groups. Um, and when we did multivariate analysis, the factors associated with treatment initiation were higher ALT, higher DNA, presence of cirrhosis, and older age. But there was no difference for education, income, type of insurance, or how long they have lived in North America. So we conclude that in this North American cohort of racially diverse adults with chronic hepatitis B, treatment initiation were higher in the Asians and lower in the Blacks, but that really is related to differences uh, in disease characteristics, viral characteristics, um, and differences in proportion meeting treatment criteria. And among those who had a treatment indication, treatment rates did not differ by race, despite market differences in education, income, and type of health insurance. And race was not an independent predictor of time to treatment initiation when adjusted for disease and racial factors, and clinical outcomes were very rare, as I've shown you earlier, uh, regardless of the race. Um, so I want to thank um, NIDDK for sponsoring this study. And these are the participating sites, and these are our grant numbers. Uh, thank you for your attention. Well, that was a terrific presentation of a lot of data, <laughs> maybe overwhelming. What proportion of patients uh, in the HBRN were foreign born? Uh, well, it's close to 80%, um, um, so 75, 80% being foreign born. Uh, and this is because many of these patients um, actually acquired hepatitis B, were infected with hepatitis B before they were immigrated. I see. And um, <clears throat> were there differences uh, between the foreign born and the American born subjects in? time to uh, treatment if they qualified for? Um, among those who met criteria, there was no difference in okay. terms of how long they have lived in this country. Right. So uh, one of our questions is, was treatment paid for by the study or by the patient's insurance out of pocket? Well, for the patients who were enrolled into one of the HBRN um, trials, um, the study provided a treatment. But there were also other patients who met some um, treatment criteria and were started on treatment per standard of care, and those were being paid for by insurance. But we actually also look at whether people were on um, commercial insurance versus Medicare, Medicaid, and whether that played a role in treatment initiation, and that was not um, associated. Right. 
-hmm. So basically, these data support the ASLD guidelines, i.e., if you have cirrhosis, you should be treated regardless. And was that found in the outcome uh, analysis that those with outcomes were not treated? Yeah, unfortunately, a couple of these patients who had outcome, um, they were started on treatment after the outcome occurred. Um, and um, so um, because this is an observational study, so sometimes we don't understand why the patients were not started on treatment, uh, whether it's because the patients refused to be on treatment, whether um, the provider did not recommend the treatment, uh, or whether there were other reasons. Right. Uh, bear in mind that um, even though we think that um, all the HBRN investigators are experts in hepatitis B, um, the patients are being managed for standard of care. So sometimes they're being managed by um, our colleagues and not necessarily the HBRN investigators. And some of the patients, some um, choose to sort of say, I don't have symptoms now. I don't want I to be on lifelong treatment. Right. Now, I guess the um, we have a, the, the other side of that is that patients who don't have cirrhosis, who don't fit the ASLD criteria, seem to do fine. And so that supports that you don't need to treat everybody, right? Yeah, I think it's one important message because I know that that is very hotly debated now. Upon yeah. diagnosis, put everyone on treatment and then we don't need to keep monitoring them. Right. Uh, well, first so of all, even if you put everyone on treatment, you still need to monitor them because the most dangerous thing is some um, people um, put on treatment and then abruptly does some um, continued treatment and are not being monitored. That can right. also be risky. And right. what we show so, is if we follow patients as the disease progress, as the virus becomes more active, you catch them, you put them on treatment, you can prevent adverse outcomes. Yes. No, but, so we have a question about the people who don't qualify. When will we have a therapy that clears surface antigen, maybe a vaccine or something? Well, um, we all know that um, there's a lot of our research into curative therapy, new antivirals, um, immunotherapy, uh, there are a number of them that show promise, but they're not ready yet for prime time. And um, I certainly hope that in the next few years, we'll have some of these being ready and approved. And the final question is what methods were used to diagnose cirrhosis? Were these actually being done during the, uh, during the trial, during the cohort study? Well, in HBRN, um, as everyone know, we don't do liver biopsies as often as we used to. Uh, for patients enrolled into the immune active um, trial that Nora will talk about later on, all the patients need to have a liver biopsy for entry. Uh, as um, During the course of clinical standard of care, only a small proportion of patients um, had liver biopsies. So the diagnosis of cirrhosis were either based on histology or imaging, um, ultrasound, CT scan, looking for nodular liver, right. evidence of portal hypertension to get a low platelet count. So it's not not completely reliable, but neither is liver biopsy. Huh? Yeah, and unfortunately at the time when we started the study back in 2009, 2010, FibroScan was not widely available right. in the US. So Absolutely. very few of our patients have FibroScan um, testing at that time. That would have been helpful. So we need to move on. Thank you, Anna, it was a terrific talk. Uh, very nicely done. Our second speaker uh, for the webinar is uh, Dr. William Lee, another well-known leader in our our field. He's a professor of medicine and he's the founder and principal investigator on our NIDDK funded acute liver failure study group, which is a very famous uh, study. He's also participated as a principal investigator in our other studies, such as Alt C and Dillon, and, uh, and of course the HBRN. Dr. Lee is going to summarize the HBRN's ancillary study on acute hepatitis B that was occurring. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> Let me get my slide up here. <laughs> Thank you, Jay and Dr. Ward, for allowing me to, to participate in this wonderful uh, three-pronged uh, review of the HBRN network. My job is to review for you this morning in brief the acute hep B study that we did as a sub-study of the overall HBRN. You've heard in detail Anna's uh, 
background information about the chronic cohort, but this was a specific small sub-study that we did uh, looking at acute hepatitis B infection. Here are my disclosures. I, none of them relate to hepatitis B, by the way. Um, so by way of background, um, we've had a safe and effective vaccine for hepatitis B for more than three decades. But if, you, if we think back, most of the studies that were done looking at the natural history of acute hepatitis B occurred in the 1970s and 1980s. So here we are 50 years later, three decades after vaccines became available, and uh, we still see more than 3,000 cases of acute hepatitis B recorded by CDC. We decided that there weren't any recent studies and that this would be a good reason to use the mechanism of HBRN, the study sites that you just heard about, as a focal point to enroll some cases with acute hepatitis B. And our main uh, outcome paper is the paper uh, cited here, Sterling et al., shown here. Uh, my colleagues on this paper were Richard Sterling from VCU, Abdus Wahed from Pittsburgh, Gavin Cloherty um, from Abbott, and Jay Hufnagel and myself. So we tried to uh, find patients, most of whom were hospitalized with acute hepatitis B infection at our participating centers and used a similar sort of design as the chronic study with some uh, unique features. We gathered all the same demographics, clinical features, and in this case, 12-month outcomes of consecutive patients with acute hep B prospectively tracked uh, and compared these uh, the features of the acute hep B patients with those of uh, the co contemporaneous chronic uh, cohort. Now, there were some differences, as you can imagine, for acute hepatitis B patients. First of all, they were virtually all hospitalized and had moderately severe uh, hepatitis at the time. That's why they came to our attention. But we also were interested in following them much more closely, as you can see here, at baseline weeks 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 18, 24, and 48. I will say, though, we had to be somewhat flexible because patients were typically only hospitalized for uh, four days or perhaps up to seven days with their acute illness and then needed to come back and see us frequently at a time when they actually were feeling quite quite well. And, uh, and uh, they presumed on clinical grounds that their infection had resolved. What we did to identify, to be certain that these were true a, acute hep cases, were to have a committee, adjudication committee, review them after we gathered all the data. So that our criteria for calling them acute hep B included detection of anti-core IgM antibody. Um, most all of them had HBSAG as well, but not quite all. Um, and they had to have had a clinical picture that we felt was compatible with acute hepatitis B. Uh, we wanted to be sure that they didn't have any evidence of chronic hep B, but of course that isn't always available. We don't always have uh, prior HBSAG testing on people that come in with acute infection. Many of them didn't know whether they'd ever had uh, hep B testing before. We used a, an additional uh, caveat, which was that the clinician involved in caring for the patient had to confirm the diagnosis in, in his or her narrative. And then, as I say, we went through the adjudication committee once all the data was in hand. Uh, beyond the usual standard testing for acute infection or chronic hep B infection, we also were able to perform quantitative surface antigen testing, quantitative e-antigen testing. Uh, we were able to also sequence for pre-core and basal core promoter mutations and do some quantitative HBV RNA and correlated antigen levels. So here's the schema of our comparison between the chronic cohort and the acute cohort as shown here. So there were approximately 1900 patients with chronic hep B and we excluded, we included the three from the uh, acute study who appeared to have chronic infection, but excluded as you heard Dr. Locke say, those that had co-infection with HIV C infection or Delta infection, and also those that participated in the therapy trials. So the cohort for this particular comparison was 1534 chronic HBB patients. In our acute uh, cohort, we had 66 patients, but with adjudication by the committee, we uh, ruled out three with chronic infection and three where we just didn't have enough data to be certain that they represent 
presented acute HPV. Of the 60 patients, 56 had full data or at least some uh, valuable longitudinal data and four only had uh, baseline data uh, exclusively. So we, we based the longitudinal studies on the 56 that had significant data there. So on baseline, the ages between the acute and the chronic group were essentially identical, but there were lots of differences otherwise. Male sex in 72% of the acute versus 50-50 in the chronics. Um, many, many more whites and blacks in the acute study than in the chronic study, as you heard Dr. Locke say. Um, and again, virtually no uh, Asian Americans in the acute study, just one uh, elderly man. Again, mostly white patients, 50% white, 25% black. And amongst the other group, they were mostly uh, Hispanic Americans. Uh, the difference which again came out in Dr. Locke's study was, was that only 18% of the chronic patients were born in North America, whereas uh, in the acute study, 80% were, were North American born. And again, the other difference that is uh, we, we expected, frankly, was that most of the cases represented sexual transmission with a smaller fraction representing injection drug use. So again, the acute hepatitis B profile was a man, either white or black, not Asian, born in the US and with suspected sexual transmission. And of the sexual transmissions, about a third of those or 25% of the overall group were considered to be same gender sexual transmission. So the serologic features are shown here, again, with the acute column on the left and the chronics on the right. Um, there was about 1.2 log higher viral load of HPV DNA in the acute group. Um, many, many more E antigen positives, as we might expect, although perhaps surprisingly, 27% were E antigen positive, uh, sorry, E antigen negative uh, at presentation. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. The genotypes, again, differed greatly from the chronic study in, in that 69% were genotype A uh, and uh, only one or two patients genotypes, I think just one patient genotype C. Um, as, and comparing to the chronic group, obviously there were 70-some uh, percent of, of uh, genotypes B and C in the chronic group as Dr. Locke outlined. <clears throat> so again, uh, amongst the the E antigen negatives, there were several that were pre, had the precore mutation, several others that had the basal core promotion, uh, promoter mutation, but only two of these had uh, the, the precore or basal core promoter as the most prominent quasi species. So we're unclear whether these patients represent uh, infection from an E negative contact or whether these are simply the evolution of E negativity during the, the evolution of the acute infection against it being uh, evolution during acute infection is the fact that the E negative group and the E positive group had essentially the same amount of time between onset of symptoms and onset of enrollment in the study. So there wasn't a longer duration of time to enrollment in the E negative group. Looking at age comparing to risk factors, again, it's pretty even across the um, different uh, decades with sexual transmission relatively even across the four different decades. And again, only four patients above the age of 60. Um, again, looking at decade of birth and whether people were US born or foreign born, again, most of them were in these middle decades, 60s, 70s, and 80s for their date of birth. Um, and we were quite interested in looking at time to loss of HBSAG and gain of anti-HBS. And the, and the sort of classic mantra has been that uh, we call it chronic hepatitis B if your HBSAG hasn't cleared by six months. And we were quite surprised to see, as you can see uh, in this slide, that the median time to surface antigen negativity for this cohort was actually 26.4 weeks. 
and the median time for anti-HBS appearance was 37 weeks. So the time to HBSAG clearance was longer uh, and only half had cleared by 24 weeks uh, into their uh, illness. And again, anti-HBS many weeks later and 15 to 20% by the time uh, the study was over had not developed anti-HBS. This is certainly longer than we, we had predicted uh, we would see. Um, so what risk factors were associated with time to HBSAG loss? Well, not very many. So some of us clinicians uh, thought uh, going into this that female sex and higher aminotransferases were associated uh, and, and that women getting acute hep B tended to have higher enzymes, higher bilirubins, and to clear virus surface antigen earlier. That did not appear to be the case. Neither age, gender, race, uh, mode of transmission were associated with a longer time to surface antigen or, or a shorter time for that matter. Um, nor was the severity of the, of the uh, infection uh, associated with ra more rapid uh, surface antigen clearance. Longer time did appear to be associated, but these are somewhat soft with uh, initial level of HBV DNA, presence of uh, E antigen, and initial HBSAG concentration, but not with initial concentration of E antigen or HBV genotype. Two patients did appear to develop chronic hepatitis B in that at two years following their infection, uh, they were still surface antigen positive. Of note, both had had relatively mild uh, infections during their acute phase. So in summary, in this small group of patients enrolled between 2011 and 2017, most were men with symptomatic icteric hepatitis, positive surface antigen, HBV DNA, and IgM anticore positive. In contrast to chronic hep B, most of the acute cases were white or black, born in the U.S., had uh, sexual exposure as their route of infection and carried genotype A2. So in conclusion, all, there's a wide age range for these patients and all but, but it's noteworthy that all but two were born before 1991, suggesting that HBV vaccination, which was initiated in, at that time, uh, has been effective in eliminating acute hep B infection. Uh, but in this cohort, the time to clearance was longer than we expected, more than six months and half of the patients, suggesting that routine definition of hep B should be uh, now not six months, but probably 12 months duration for us to, to declare that someone is, has a chronic infection. We're suggesting on the basis of these findings that CDC may wish to uh, change its vaccine strategy recommendation. The current recommendation is that it's recommended for those 59 or younger and for 60 or older only in people who have a specific risk factor. Since we had four patients greater than 60 years of age, most of whom didn't have a, an a identifiable risk factor, we would suggest that the uh, vaccine strategy should be uh, vaccinate everyone between ages 30 and 80. Uh, uh, as one possible suggestion for revision to the CDC current recommendations. Again, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources for these studies and the study sites that participated in the study. Thank you, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Will, that was terrific. We have a few questions we can address quickly. Um, uh, one question from Dr. Ghani is, uh, these data strongly advocate for catch-up HPV vaccination in U.S. adults. What do you say about that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't think we've been as uh, active, proactive in getting uh, people in the older age group vaccinated for sure. Um, and again, we, if we don't know the risk factors, I, I think we should try to spread a wider net. So I guess another question is, um, let me see here. Uh, 
Was there any change in the proportion of patients with acute hepatitis B who reported injection drug use over time? Um, again, the years of the study were 2011 to 17, and I'm not aware that there was any difference over the time period of the study. But again, it's a small study. Um, the, the limitations of the study were, were both the small size, also the fact that they were all hospitalized patients. We don't know how many patients might you know, be community uh, infected within the community, see, see a physician once or twice and not, not be sick enough to, to be hospitalized. Um, so, so, you know, and the other, the third point uh, is that our follow-up uh, was, as I implied earlier, was a little bit limited simply because people that felt well didn't necessarily want to come back uh, for multiple follow-up visits. So we should point out only 10% of patients in, uh, admitted to injection drug use, though a very large group were uh, gay men with hepatitis B, and it, it points to the fact that we're failing to, you know, get to everyone who actually has risk factors and deserves to be to be vaccinated. Exactly. I mean, and, I, uh, how often does a clinician, uh, let's say, a primary care physician, explore risk factors uh, fully? Right. Um, I guess that that leads to the recommendation that everyone should be considered for possible to have to be vaccination. Everyone right. over thirty. Well, the, the trouble is there's so many risk factors that uh, it's difficult, but the one risk factor that didn't show up was uh, being born abroad, right? That's correct. That, uh, that's a risk factor for screening for hepatitis B. Right. A very big risk factor, right? Right. But for acute, for vaccination, it's strange that we didn't see uh, acute hepatitis B in family members, for instance, of patients with chronic hepatitis B as a risk factor. No, to my knowledge, there were no, no patients in that category. I think it's important to point out, too, that the Asian patient that was included in here was born in the United States and had a genotype that's not typical of Asia. So it clearly was sexual transmission in a person who was an Asian American. Yeah. So we had another question about false positivity as far as antibody after vaccination. Uh, Brian McMahon, you're there. <laughs> Maybe you'd talk about that. Um, in testing people who've been vaccinated many years before, uh, do you pay attention to whether they have antibodies still? Does that make a difference? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, we we uh, just published our 35-year follow-up study in hepatology, I think a couple months ago it came out, where we vaccinated um, prior to the licensure uh, of about 1,500 people in, in uh, Western Alaska is the only area in, in the U.S. that's endemic for HBV among the Yupik and Inupiat Eskimo population. And we followed the, uh, the patients that we vaccinated for 35 years. And we uh, a couple of comments that uh, with, uh, would, uh, so would uh, pertain to Dr. Lee's discussion. First of all, uh, there were about 25 breakthrough infections in people who actually responded to the vaccine and developed anti-HBS. And of those 25 infections, um, none of them had acute symptomatic. None of them became chronic. They 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 lost H they lost HBS AG within a year of the time they were infected. Um, and no, and none of them have had any adverse outcomes as far as liver disease goes. So I think the va the the uh, vaccine protects. And and furthermore. If they lost HBSAG, which more than half did after or anti-HBS, excuse me, after vaccination, 90% um, uh, responded to a booster dose. And so we feel that the vaccine does last for a long period of time. Anti-HBS can disappear after vaccination. Um, and many people, especially older people, are vaccinated. But that doesn't mean that they're not uh, immune to uh, reinfection. I think they are immune, and I don't think uh, booster doses are really necessary. If that answers the not question. Yet, at least, uh, booster dose might be recommended for very high risk people, but uh, immunosuppressed general, people, I think. It doesn't seem to be could, necessary. And I yeah. think studies support that as well. One question, uh, Will, uh, we had is were, were people with acute hepatitis B treated? Yeah, with, that's an interesting with question. Nucleoside? Um, there, there were just four or five that were treated with nucleoside analog just, just in hospital. And again, no one developed acute liver failure. Uh, 
Um, no one, no one seemed to have very severe disease or or progression towards ALF. Right, right. Okay. I think uh, we need to move on to the next presentation. There were some other questions. We'll come back to some of those. Sure. One of the questions relates to: Are the samples from this these studies available for study? And the answer to that is they will be. At the conclusion of the HBRM, the data as well as the samples will be placed in the NIDDK repository at, from which you can uh, apply to, to obtain them for ancillary studies of, of serology, for instance, and so forth. So that will occur. It's not, they're not quite ready that yet because the study is just now winding up, but we are going to deposit all those. And we'd like, we'd encourage you to use them, to come back to them and look at them. There are many questions that, that could be answered from these, from these samples. Okay, let me go to the next speaker. All right. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Uh, Nora Terrell, who uh, is also well known to this, to this group. Um, she is professor of uh, medicine and chief of the gastrointestinal and liver disease division of the University of Southern California uh, Keck School of, of Medicine. She has also participated in many of NIDDK's clinical research networks, including the HBRM, and is now the chair and principal uh, investigator in our newly initiated uh, network called the Liver Cirrhosis Network. She is also uh, currently the president of the ASLD, so she's a very busy person, and we are indeed pleased to have her present today. She will give an overview of the outcome of results of the HBRN's treatment of chronic hepatitis B. Nora. You're on mute, Nora. There we go. Thanks everyone. Uh, and Jay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, we are, um, I'm very excited to really present these data to you. The um, key publication from our randomized control trial was very recently published, uh, but I'm gonna do a bit of a deeper dive into some of the areas today, um, really in the context of really uh, focusing on this issue of increasing hepatitis B surface antigen loss or achievement of functional cure. Is there a way for me to turn off the, are you, are you all seeing the caption? Yes. Does anyone know how to turn that off? <laughs> I'm happy to do it, but it's, it may be distracting to you all. You can go to caption settings on your Zoom if you can find that and turn it off yourself. One second, let me do that. I just okay. need to as well. Okay. It's close. I thought, it was, I thought it was very progressive of you. <laughs> well, I, I'm feeling like it might be distracting. So do I go, <laughs> is it under preferences? Does it I've never actually had it on, so I'm kind of like surprised. I a slideshow. Okay. Um up there. Okay. Uh hey, unclick that, try that. Okay. Uh let's try again. All right, these are my disclosures, uh, and that looks more promising. Thanks. All right, so uh, the study design. Uh, I'll just say that our, our primary uh, aim of the study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of 192 weeks of tenofovir DF alone in combination with 24 weeks of pecodiferon alpha 2A, and then to use a protocolized treatment withdrawal. And our target population was immune active chronic hepatitis B. So going from left to right, um, you can see that it was a one-to-one -one randomization of TDF for 192 weeks or four years, or TDF with 24 weeks of pecodiferin alpha 2A for the first 24 weeks. At week 192, individuals who were eligible for withdrawal of TDF uh, were then withdrawn. The eligibility criteria in terms of withdrawal included having an HBV DNA level less than 1,000 for the prior 24 weeks, an absence of cirrhosis, and then through two safety amendments, we also ultimately required all patients to be E antigen negative and anti-HBE positive. If individuals didn't meet the withdrawal criteria during the withdrawal phase, they continued on TDF. And then the patients were followed up to week 240 
And at that point, the end of uh, study uh, assessments were made. And our primary outcome was surface antigen loss. And I'll focus primarily on that outcome. But we also had many secondary outcomes, including E antigen loss and a profile consistent with inactive chronic hepatitis B, as well as safety. The key inclusion criteria for the study are very typical for an immune active population. We included both E antigen positive and negative. We stratified based on uh, E antigen status at entry. Uh, we also stratified on genotype A versus non-A and presence or absence of cirrhosis. You can see that they had to be on, on no prior antiviral therapy for the prior 24 weeks. We required an ALT level above 1.5 times upper limit of normal. Um, HPV DNA levels greater than 1,000 and absence of co-infection. Um, we did have liver biopsies in all patients coming into study, and they had to have a biopsy that showed an HAI of at least three or a fibrosis score of one. And of course, because we were having uh, PEG interferon as one of the treatment arms and absence of contraindications to PEG interferon. Now shown on the right is just um, specific aspects around the withdrawal phase. Um, I mentioned that it was a protocolized withdrawal. So we had very specific rules around how we monitored for ALT flares and when we intervened with retreatment. Um, and we also had a protocol in which the, the ALT level um, led to different differences in terms of the frequency of monitoring. Again, maximizing the safety in terms of how we did withdrawal. And retreatment was indicated for those with severe or prolonged ALT flares. So you can see the retreatment criteria shown on the far right include any clinical decompensation, anyone with an elevated total bilirubin of three or higher, or direct of one or higher. And then for most patients, it came down to having kind of persistent elevation of ALT and HBV DNA. We required the HBV DNA to be greater than 10,000. And then either an ALT that was greater than 1,000 for a week greater than 300 or 200 for males, females for greater than or equal to four weeks, or a level of greater than or equal to 150 for more than 12 weeks. Those would lead to retreatment. So this is the study flow, and it's a busy slide, and I'm going to highlight uh, several aspects. So we screened 181 individuals, 102 were enrolled, 102 in the TDF group, and 99 in the combination group. We had uh, a few dropouts before uh, week 192, but overall completion of the study was very high. Um, at week 192 in the tenofovir group, 96 patients were evaluated for withdrawal and 51 met criteria for withdrawal. Of those 51 that were withdrawn in the TDF group, five were restarted due to this protocol change. I mentioned that we added in the requirement for being E antigen negative and having anti-HBE that, that was the result of our first two patients who were e-angin positive having quite significant and severe flares. So we changed the protocol. So we had five patients who restarted due to that protocol change here, leaving 46 patients in the TDF group who were, were withdrawn. And during the withdrawal phase, seven of those individuals met criteria for retreatment. In the combination group, 92 patients were evaluated for withdrawal of which 60 met criteria for withdrawal. Of those four also uh, were restarted due to the protocol change, leaving uh, 56 patients who were withdrawn. And of those five required restart during the follow-up period uh, from one week 192 to week 240. So I'll be sharing results at 240, recognizing that when we look at 240, it's a combination of patients who were withdrawn and patients who are continued on treatment, depending on whether they met criteria. So what about the patient characteristics at baseline? They're shown here. They're very well matched. Um, about 30 to 40 percent were female. There were 80 percent or so that were of Asian uh, American uh, race. Mean age was 41. Seven percent had cirrhosis. The genotype distribution is shown here, and I highlight that we uh, differentiate between A1 and A2 here. Remember that we stratify based on A, uh, but the A2 becomes relevant when we talk at the results. But you can see because we had a population of predominantly Asian Americans that genotypes B and C do predominate in the study. About half of the patients were E antigen positive. The mean HPV DNA levels at treatment start were around six, six and a half log. ALT levels you can see were approximately two to threefold uh, upper limits of normal. And the quant surface antigen about three to three and a half log. So here's the main result, which is our loss of surface antigen. And I'm showing here at the top, the intent to treat analysis showing week 192 and 240. 
And then the graphic shows the cumulative incidence of surface antigen loss by treatment group. And a highlight on the graphic when PEG interferon was stopped, which was at um, which was actually at week 24, and uh, the TDF when it was stopped at 192 and those that were eligible. What you can see is at week 24, approximately 5% of patients had achieved surface antigen loss with no difference between the treatment arms. However, how they came to lose surface antigen does appear to be different. You can see that in the tenofovir group, that most of the uh, loss of surface antigen occurred during the withdrawal phase. In contrast, we see um, more of the ES antigen loss occurring in the combination group earlier in treatment. And indeed, during the withdrawal phase, we didn't see any additional S antigen loss in the combination arm. This is a table that just depicts the characteristics of these patients, the nine patients who lost surface antigen. And I just want to highlight a few things. The first, um, if we look uh, at the race, you'll see that we had uh, two individuals who are of Asian American race, um, we have kind of represent the whole spectrum here, but really a predominance of white given how many um, individuals of Caucasian race were in the study and how many are represented here. You can see the majority were E antigen positive at treatment onset. Indeed, eight out of the nine who lost S antigen were in the E antigen positive group. And then a very striking association with genotype, subgenotype. And you can see that of those that um, lost surface antigen, seven out of the nine had subgenotype A2. Now, finally, at the very end, you'll see that an, another differentiating feature, again, highlighted by the cumulative um, curves of surface antigen loss, is in the TDF group that most of those losses occurred off treatment in the, in the period between week 192 and 240, um, and in the combination group, predominantly on treatment. Just one more uh, kind of key um, slide re regarding the subgenotype. So here I'm presenting it in a slightly different way. Here what we're looking at is among those with a specific genotype, what proportion of them lost surface antigen. And you can see that among those that are genotype A2, subgroup, subtype A2, that 60% of those patients, regardless of treatment group, uh, lost uh, S antigen in the course of this study. So a very striking association that we found in our study between geno subgenotype A2 and, and make the distinction from A1, where here we see that none of those individuals uh, lost surface antigen. Um, the other thing to note in this uh, figure is of the very low rate across other uh, genotypes, but of those that have genotype B and C who lost surface antigen, uh, that those only occurred in patients who received combination therapy. Um, moving on to other aspects of what factors were associated with S antigen loss. Well, remember that the number of S antigen losses are quite low, so we can't do a multivariate analysis to look at sort of things that predict S antigen loss. Rather, what we're presenting here is just by different subgroups, what are the incidence rates or the proportions in which they received as, that achieved S antigen loss. So um, not too many surprises here, but just to give you a context of the magnitude of difference. So you can see Asian versus non-Asian, 1.4%, sorry, that's flipped. <laughs> Non-Asian was 1.4%, 20%, sorry, that's not flipped. Asians were 1.4%, our non-Asians were 20.6%, where I highlighted that the whites and blacks were the individuals who had S antigen loss. Again, the E antigen positive was a relevant factor, A2. And then we see that high viral load and high S antigen levels at baseline were associated with higher rates of S antigen loss. Our interpretation of those data is it's really reflective of E antigen status. So it sort of goes in hand with our association of E antigen being positive patients having higher rates of S antigen loss. Now this uh, shows this E antigen versus uh, positive versus negative. And here what we're looking at is rather than looking at loss, which we have very few of here, what we're focused on is the decline in surface antigen um, over time. So there is a, a greater decline um, in terms of log IU per ML. Um, in the E antigen positive group compared to the E antigen negative group um, over the course of the study. Um, and moreover, there's that earlier decline that we see um, in uh, patients who are um, E antigen positive and more so in individuals who are treated with a combination therapy. Now, I did mention we also had several secondary outcomes. Um, I did wanna focus the talk here on S antigen, but just to make the point that E antigen loss 
was seen in, in among the 103 who were e-antigen positive at a higher rate in our combination group uh, compared to the TDF alone. Um, and the other one aspect of uh, secondary outcomes that I wanted to emphasize is what we would call inactive chronic hepatitis B at the end of treatment at week 240. Um, and this is, um, so I highlight here, this would be described as somebody who has an HPV DNA level under 1,000, a normal ALT, and is E antigen negative. And I, I show the results. They're not statistically significant between the two treatment groups, although there is a numerical difference. You can see that in the combination group that was seen in 33% of patients, TDF alone, 18% of patients. And then the, the, set, the final bar at the very bottom um, is that same inactive chronic hepatitis B, but this is only among patients who were withdrawn from treatment. So this is an off-treatment response. And you can see that approximately 32 and 25% of patients in the two arms achieve that endpoint. Now a little, just one slide on safety. I think it's really important. Uh, the withdrawal um, of a TDF is recognized to be something that can be potentially of risk. First of all, just to highlight, we had AEs in uh, 280 total if 201 per participants, but only 3% of them were serious adverse events. Um, the first thing is that the vast majority of them are unrelated to treatment. But of those that I want to emphasize, the first is that we had two life-threatening and definitely related complications in the group that received TDF alone. Both of these patients uh, developed this life-threatening hepatic decompensation during um, the withdrawal of the TDF. And indeed, these are the two patients who are E antigen positive because our initial criteria allowed us to withdraw those patients if they otherwise met uh, the HBV, DNA, and ALT criteria. But of course, when we had these two events, this led to the amendment of our protocol so that no longer were E antigen positive patients withdrawn. And then the other thing to note is that in the PEG interferon arm, we did also have two um, seri uh, three serious um, um, probable and three definitely related um, adverse events. These are, I think, well recognized to be potentially interferon associated, but just highlights the challenges in potentially using PEG interferon, but overall rates were low. So to summarize the first part, because I'm going to now do a deeper dive into ALT flares, but just in terms of the main messages from our uh, randomized trial, overall rates of S antigen loss were low, 5%, and not significantly enhanced by the combination of PEG interferon for 24 weeks with this longer term TDF uh, following and uh, a protocolized withdrawal. However, we do show that S antigen loss timing is different when a patient receives PEG interferon um, as part of their initial treatment. The withdrawal of TDF after four years was safely achieved, particularly in an amended protocol in which they required patients to be E antigen negative and anti HBE positive. And we feel that that's a very important aspect um, in terms of uh, a criteria for withdrawal, as well, of course, as the absence of cirrhosis. Um, S antigen loss strongly uh, influenced by subgenotype and um, the association with A2 is one of the very novel aspects of this study. But we also highlight the importance of E antigen status, where we had well characterized E antigen positive negative groups to compare and show that E antigen positive status at onset of treatment is an important predictor of S antigen loss. And I think this is something that maybe warrants greater consideration in new therapeutic trials. And then finally, the one other thing to note is in this very well protocolized uh, approach that the rate of S antigen loss in individuals who started out E antigen negative was extremely low, less uh, only about 1%, which highlights that this is a group in which I think there's still a huge need for new therapeutic approaches. Now I'm going to spend a, a few minutes just to delve into ALT flares because these were very carefully collected in the study. Um, all of our ALT flares were adjudicated. Um, and we had um, in the trial itself, flares were characterized in a specific way uh, based on an ALT level greater than or equal to 300 and 200 for males and females. But the data I'm gonna share with you are actually from post hoc analyses in which we um, use a more refined approach to talking about ALT flares. And for these analysis, it required uh, that the ALT be greater than two times the baseline or in the case of withdrawal flares, two times greater than the ALT at the time of treatment withdrawal. And then um, they had to also meet the criteria for um, a flare intensity, which we characterize as mild, moderate, or severe. 
So what I'd like to first share with you is uh, data that uh, has been presented by uh, Bob Perillo, um, not yet published, uh, in which we've focused on ALT flares during treatment. And what you can see here is that we had 40, um, 46 participants uh, who had a total of 50 on treatment flares. Uh, shown in the figure is uh, the, the proportion that had flares. You can see that um, there were um, ALT flares, both in patients who received TDF alone, as well as in those that received combination therapy, although they were more frequent in the group that received combination therapy. Um, not shown here, but what I can share with you is that they were also more common in patients who are E antigen positive. And when we looked at the relationship between having an on, uh, on treatment ALT flare and having S antigen decline, because uh, in this case, what you can see is the flare, patients who had flares had a much greater likelihood of being able to achieve a decline in surface antigen to less than 100. That's shown on the left. And shown on the right is that the decline in quantitative surface antigen is indeed related to the severity of the flare. And you can see going from top to bottom, no mild, moderate, and severe flare, that we also see that moderate, moderate and severe flares um, during treatment were associated with a greater likelihood of S antigen decline, and that was specifically seen in the combination group. So this ALT flares is a marker for um, this effect on S antigen decline. And in the study, which looked at patients that then got to the end of their uh, treatment of week 192, and how many of them had um, a surface antigen level less than 100, you can see that um, the same uh, factors that uh, we sort of spoke about earlier are coming out. There is, um, in this analysis, in which we use surface antigen um, that was less than 100 um, as the outcome, that there is a difference between the treatment groups. Genotype A comes out being important. Um, a baseline quantitative surface antigen is also important, but really what I want to emphasize is again, that the flare group is a group that had a higher likelihood of achieving that outcome. Now I'm gonna flip from the ALT flares on treatment to now the ALT flares that occurred during treatment withdrawal. And I think one of the key questions that the network wanted to answer is, is a post withdrawal flare beneficial? That has been in the literature that this is something that is necessary in order to get S antigen loss or S antigen decline. So for this analysis, this is just to show that, that it's a subgroup. Um, you can see that the ones withdrawn were 43 in the tenofovir alone and 49 in the combo group. And this is just to show you their characteristics at the time of withdrawal. They're, they're quite, um, quite well balanced. Um, with the exception be that there's a, a greater proportion in the combination group had a quantitative surface antigen level less than 100 at the time of treatment withdrawal. But when we look at, again, flares here and their relationship to um, uh, various characteristics, the first thing is to say that the rate of flares in those withdrawn didn't differ by their treatment group, that's shown on the left. And shown on the right is, did the likelihood of flare vary by whether they're E antigen positive versus negative? And the answer is that yes, ALT flares after TDF withdrawal were more frequent and they tended to occur earlier in the E antigen negative patients. Um, but interestingly, retreatment was actually required more often in our E antigen positive patients. And then finally, does that flare lead to S antigen decline? Is it a benefit in that? Do, do we see that linkage? And what this shows us here focused on the grade three flares of greater than five times upper limit of normal or higher is that they're not. And that indeed the ALT flares did not associate with the decline in surface antigen or S antigen loss in follow-up. And indeed the S antigen decline was greater in participations without a grade three ALT flare. And when we did an analysis looking at the predictors of ALT flares, um, we indeed showed that ALT flares are more common um, early after TDF withdrawal. They're more common in older participants and they're more likely in individuals who have a pretreatment um, high HPV DNA level. But probably the most important finding in our study was that these grade three flares could be predicted uh, by an HPV DNA level on the visit prior. So if their HPV DNA level was four logs on the prior visit, they had a much greater likelihood of ALT flares of grade three or higher, suggesting that we can predict these severe flares and that it, these flares in turn are not related to surface antigen loss. 
So one final slide, I know that this is a lot of data, but just to leave you with, well, what about the idea that ALT flares um, can be beneficial in terms of achieving inactive chronic hepatitis B? So now looking at that as an endpoint, um, inactive in this uh, graphic is shown by the blue and then shown here are flare versus no flare groups using grade three, five times um, or more times upper limit of normal. And it shows that again, the ALTF flares are associated with, um, are not, a, a, are, are the ALT flares uh, group, which is shown here is much more likely to have active chronic hepatitis B at the end of the study. So again, not a benefit, but actually potentially telling us uh, a risk. So just to conclude, this is my last slide in terms of summarizing the flare data, is that overall in the study, we had flares throughout the study in about one quarter to a third of the patients with no difference between the treatment groups overall. But there was a higher proportion early in treatment with the PEG interferon um, tenofovir group, higher proportion later in TDF alone. We showed that ALT flares on treatment do predict a decline in quantitative surface antigen, but we showed that ALT flares during withdrawal do not. And moreover, that a, a HPV DNA level of greater than four log prior on a prior visit predicted a flare that could be of severe nature. So with that, I'll close. And again, I want to acknowledge um, really uh, this collaborative effort and in particular, um, want to thank my colleague for all of their efforts in executing this trial. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Nora, for that <laughs> presentation of very complex data. Let, let me say something about it. I believe <clears throat> what the study showed is, is that we're dealing with two diseases, the E-positive disease and E-negative disease. In E-negative disease, the addition of interferon didn't do anything. There's no increased loss of S. And by the end of treatment, there was equal suppression of HPV DNA and ALT. It did seem to have an effect in E antigen positive patients. You showed the, the close association of A2 with response. It's important to point out it was only A2 and E positive patients. If you were A2 and E negative, nobody cleared S. If you were A2 and E positive, 100% of patients who got PEG interferon cleared E and S. If you were E positive and received tenofovir alone, there's small numbers, there are only six patients, but uh, only uh, of those, only uh, four lost surface antigen. There were two who did not. So I, I think I think it's if as far as PEG interferon is concerned, which is the study was supposed to address, does the addition of PEG interferon add anything to therapy? I think it doesn't if you're E negative. If you're E positive, it leads to an earlier loss and more secure loss of both E and surface. In fact, the loss of E with PEG interferon was over 60%, whereas with with uh, tenofovir alone, it was 30%. So it, the, the addition of PEG interferon does add something, but what the study also shows is that we need another agent to really get a, a solid 100% loss of E and loss of S. So with that, let's go to the questions. <clears throat> One question is um, the... Um, this is going back to um, the question is, if you lose surface antigen, did anybody rebound and become positive again? We didn't have any zero reversions for S, for okay. S. So once they acquired surface antigen, we did not see anybody who flip flop back. Um, Even with withdrawal? Pardon me? Even with withdrawal? During withdrawal, we did not see anybody who flipped. I mean, what, you know, it, there are some individuals whose surface antigen, it, you know, we have the levels as well. So you can sort of sometimes see they're right at the threshold. I'm not sure that that's really somebody who's flipped so much as that we have a kind of detection issue. But I think anyone in which we saw surface antigen that was truly not right at the threshold, but was negative, we did not see those individuals flip back during withdrawal. Right. Uh, Jay, this is Brian, and I'll comment on that too, because we have a, 
Uh, we're about to submit a, our paper on HBSCG loss of following uh, 1,100 people for 32,000 years of follow-up in Alaska. And I agree with Nora completely. We found that there that there's a few people that be, became transiently HBSAG positive after ELOS, but they all lost, uh, they all can flip back to HBSAG negative. Now, possibly there's more sensitive tests to detect HBSAG than what we have commercially. And I know NIH is, is, uh, is working on this, NIDDK. Uh, but uh, uh, right now I'd say, I think HBSAG loss, you can be very confident that it, that it does occur. And then the other comment is that it's important to remember that A2 genotype is a European genotype, not the African, that's A1A3. Interestingly, the, all the African-American persons in the study that had A genotype had A2. And so I think uh, that, um, that that's an important uh, issue. And I think and I, I, that those findings on A2 are very interesting and, I, and wor worthwhile looking at again. We do have some A2 data too. Right. Now, also, the, the, the drop in S titer with the flare, I think that's due to clearance of E antigen. When you clear E antigen, the titer surface antigen drops by about a log. So the flares are mostly E antigen clearance flares. And with that, there's this drop in HPV DNA. So I, I'm, I'm of the belief that a flare is usually bad. <laughs> But a flare on treatment is not necessarily bad. No, I, I think that our you have to look at what HPV DNA is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. See. Yeah, but I mean, I think if you're just, I think it's to make that distinction that on treatment ALT flares are quite different than what we are seeing post uh, in the withdrawal phase. Right. And probably our data is, um, I think, uh, uh, building on data that are suggesting that this. Uh, concept that an ALT flare is kind of a necessary component of withdrawal in order to get S antigen loss. I think we're adding to that. I think this study very strongly shows that the that having flares isn't a requirement to getting S antigen loss. In fact, most of our patients who had S antigen loss and follow up just it's the continued slow decline of surface antigen. So I think that helps us because in these withdrawal studies, it's always kind of unclear about should you intervene, yes or no. And so I think, you know, having this concept that severe flares for sure are not beneficial. And now we potentially have a way to identify such flares earlier. And maybe that's going to help us to do it in a more safe fashion. Right. No, oh, Nora the flares and Jane, actually you... occur before the loss of E. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the enzymes are fall to normal by the time the E is lost. It's it's we still don't explain, don't quite understand what it is that that's, that it's yeah. that's what's happening. Uh, but Jay the association North, with flare and a drop of HPV DNA is favorable, okay. as opposed to withdrawal where the HPV DNA is Going. rising. All right. Yeah. Exactly. Is there any evidence of, of mutations in the in the virus in those people that had flares? Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have that data. data. We don't have that data. That's Again, it comes question. back to this issue of the repository of this study will be available eventually. And we're going to try to show you the website at which you can um, look at the repository. I think it's time for us to go to the panel. Many of the questions will, will be addressed at that time too. Our panel members are, are shown here, it includes Dr. Patricia Farsi, who's with the uh, NIAID in charge of the section on uh, hepatic pathogenesis. Uh, Dr. Paul or Skip Hayashi, who's now at the FDA, formerly at the University of uh, North Carolina, is also one of our, our, our active members of other uh, networks, including the Dillon Network. And uh, Dr. Brian McMahon, who's uh, at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and has, who's done so much in, in demonstrating the, the efficacy and uh, usefulness of hepatitis B vaccination. You can point out that while we're still having acute hepatitis B in the, in the lower 48, Alaska has really the record of having a very high baseline level of hepatitis B that has decreased to, uh, to very low, right, Brian? That's correct. Yes. So these are our panel members, and uh, I'd like to first uh, solicit 
questions from them that you have about any of these or, or comments. Patricia? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Jay? And uh, I have a question just uh, for Nora. You did uh, a terrific presentation and uh, you really presented the very important data, especially in line with the current trend uh, to shift uh, from a long term or even lifelong uh, uh, treatment to a finite course. However, you showed that there was no significant increase in HBSG clearance, and some develop severe flares that require the reintroduction of nucleoside analogs. So my first question for you, based on your experience, is do you think that in clinical practice, Outside the clinical trials, it is prudent to adopt this strategy, considering that the risk of a severe flare that sometimes is even higher than the benefit, especially in patients that are E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B. So in other words, I mean, if in Italy, in other country, chronic hepatitis B is characterized 90% by antigen negative chronic hepatitis B and in 30% of patients with cirrhosis. So my question is, can you please comment on the generalizability of your finding, considering that in your study, most of the population were uh, from Asian? And also, I was very, uh, I think one of your most striking findings is that the genotype A2 response to therapy is only for E antigen, not for E antigen negative. So this is a very striking, I think we need to do a lot of study to see if there are any difference. But in any case, your data are very important. I'm sure that open a lot of debate about also the extension of the study to all the other countries where chronic hepatitis B is mostly e antigen negative. So I, I, I would highlight that, you know, this is one of the few prospective studies. And I think that that's why it's an important study. And we had this very nice equal representation of e antigen positive and negative, allowing us to really see differences there that really aren't apparent in other studies where they start with people who've been on nukes for a long time and then they they're all the antigen negative and they they withdraw so we i think you're right bring different information forward for practitioners mm -hmm. i i think that what we show is overall this strategy results in a very low rate of surface antigen loss and requires an intensive degree of follow-up right and with some potential risk for flares so i personally think the balance isn't right to make this prime time yet Right. So this isn't something we should say everyone should do because the benefit that surface antigen loss is quite modest. And we still, I think, requires a, an intensive follow up. And then there's still some risk. But, you know, there we all know that there are some patients who are very keen to come off treatment. Um, and then I think it's a matter of you know having that very detailed discussion. The good news is there are other studies kind of helping to identify other predictors. So we, we also show that if you are e-antigen positive, that maybe that's a better scenario. We show that the level of surface antigen makes a difference. So there are other aspects that can come into play in making an individual patient decision. But in terms of like a, a guidance around we should withdraw everyone, I think our study would say that that's not a strategy that should be adopted. And I have my colleagues here, so I'm sure Anna and and, so and they'll probably have different important, ideas. Yeah, I want to point out that genotype D, which is common in Italy, Italy. Yeah. there were no responders, right? Basically, no no S loss. Anna, do you want to comment? Yeah, only yeah. one out of eighty seven patients was very striking that they lose HBSG. I mean, that's what really, also compared to other studies that have been published where keeping uh, tenofovir for many years, you have at least 8% of patients that clear HBSIG. I don't know whether, you know, so this comes the variability and the heterogeneity of the patients in clinical trial. But I think your data are very, very important also about the role of the quantitative HBSIG in following the patients. Very important data, Nora. 
Well, I, I think that um, a very important point is um, hepatitis B is not a homogeneous disease. And sometimes when you read other people's results, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can just apply it to your patients. You have to look at um, the patient population from which the data was derived and your own patient. Um, and um, I mean, Nora showed very um, clearly that, um, I mean, the approach of um, taking nudes off from um, therapy um, for the Asian patients is not going to be beneficial, or very rarely beneficial. And this is also true in other studies where they have compared Caucasians and um, Asians um, and um, show a major difference. So uh, the genotype D, I mean, I think it's, it's because um, the German studies and Italian studies, they were all yet negative. I think what we, um, the reason why we could find genotype A, A2 is because we included half of the patients yet uh, at the start of treatment. If it were all yet negative at the start, maybe we won't be able to show this. So the question is, why does genotype A2 not able to evolve into an E negative chronic hepatitis B? That's, that's, kind of what we're seeing here. Well, I right. think in part is related to the epsilon and the um, pre-call mutation, um, the, um, the C1858 and the G 1896 uh, whether you break that um, CG bonding or not. Um, so right. that's really uh, related to that. Um, and um, HBRN also published a study, um, Daryl was involved in that um, pre-call call promoter mutation study where we did um, find some patients with genotype A that were able to select for the pre-call um, stop hold on mutation, but then they had a change at the 1858 position to allow them to have that um, stop hold on mutation. Right. Um, so we don't really know why the, why the A2s respond better, but this mm -hmm. issue of their lack of ability to, to create the pre-core mutant may account for why they cleared S so quickly. Um, other comments? Um, I have, have questions uh, for you, Will, uh, about the delayed clearance mm -hmm. of HPV DNA. Is that, is that a predictor of chronicity of acute hepatitis B? No, no. I think these late uh, clearances. And again, we were looking at S antigen. There, of course, there's data on, on DNA, but we haven't didn't specifically look at exact timing of HP D, DNA clearance versus S antigen. But they were they were typically close together, but but I, I don't have specific data on that. But but I, I think um I, I think this is just real life that that our earlier definition was was perhaps a limited one. I don't know why it, otherwise it would have changed over the decades. But I, there's no evidence that the longer duration patients developed bad disease. I, th I think they typically had very low enzymes and just right. seemed to have persistence of S. And it was it was a reason for keeping people in in the in the clinic and having them come back and come back and come back because again we wanted to see S clearance, which I, I always follow my patients to have S clearance if if at all possible if you can keep them on board. Well, it's, it's well known that the patients who develop chronic hepatitis B typically have mild or minimal acute disease, it's right. usually asymptomatic, they become. The ones with symptomatic acute hepatitis B, the vast majority will, will eventually clear. Absolutely. So, uh, treatment throws a ringer in that, doesn't it? Now, Brian, I have a question here about, let's say they say that this person Investigator says that they have young patients who were vaccinated at birth who are surface antigen positive when she sees them. Have you seen this at all, breakthroughs? Yeah, we, we actually have seen a couple of pa patients uh, that were vaccinated. And there was no follow-up to, to determine whether they, they actually uh, responded or not. One person, one patient was vaccinated right at birth. And then, uh, and his his mother was surface antigen positive. We don't know what her titer was at the time. He got four doses of vaccine uh, with the fourth dose at year one, and he became and he developed hepatocellular carcinoma at age 28. Was HBSAG positive? Nice. So it, there are failures that do occur, and um, and with with the birth dose vaccination, uh, 
uh, the failure rate could be as high as 10%. Um, and so that's why I think the, the recommendations of using both HBIG and antiviral therapy uh, at a certain cutoff of HEV DNA are really important. And the other thing I think that's been shown in, in our studies and also other studies is that it's the younger people when they get infected under the age of five that have the highest rate of HBSAG carriage, about 30%, if they have not been infected by their mother. So it's really important to, to, to get the, the vaccination series uh, starting at birth and completing that. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources to, to test everyone that gets vaccinated or follow everyone that gets vaccinated okay. in the U.S. But the, the, we need to follow the pregnant. We need to test the women who are uh, and find out who's HBSAG positive and test their viral load and make the decisions about what we're going to do for the offspring for the baby at that point. So uh, perhaps, Nora, you can address the issue of the, the antigen-positive mother with high levels of virus, where this is probably occurring, this breakthrough and failure of vaccination. Yes, well, that's, that, that has been established that the high level of viremia, which um, in these moms can be a risk factor, especially in uh, countries where they're using vaccine alone and not vaccine plus HBIG, um, and that there can be a vaccine failure rate as high as 10% which is why we've now, you know, even WHO is now recommending that women with uh, viral loads over 200,000 should be on antiviral therapy in the third trimester to try to reduce that risk and, and has been shown to be effective in terms of a strategy. So, so there's an issue of flares during treatment and now we have a, a Skip Hayashi here from the FDA and this is a real problem in, in treating liver disease is how to interpret flares is it due to drug-induced liver injury, for instance? Or is it, yeah. in this situation, it looks like it may, it's a part of the disease that may be actually beneficial. Right, so yeah, thank you for that. But um, I, yeah, I had a question for Nora too, but I'll, I'll answer yours, Jay. I, I, I think that that is true. But the nice thing about the HPV trials is, you know, the ones at least I've been brought in on, um, you have good data. You know, you get DNA data, you get serologic data. And generally speaking, you know, we can tease that out and adjudicate those cases and say, no, this looks like a flare of virus, or no, maybe this is some billy. Um, I think the bigger challenge is, you know, when we screen the whole study, you know, we've been using eDish for years, and it, it just doesn't work when your baselines are all over the place. And that's actually the bigger challenge for us there. But I don't think on a case level, it's that big a deal because they generally give us DNA levels. And if there's a flare, they're watching them and they're, they're are trying to figure it out as they go as well. Um, but along those lines of flares, I had a question for Nora because I, I um, you know, I looked at the paper and, uh, you know, I was about ready to say, well, that's, you know, interferon combination therapy, where it's probably not going to go anywhere. But then at the end of your talk, you started saying about flares, on treatment flares being associated with surface antigen loss. Well, my question to you is, I assume those flares were on the peg interferon on is 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 that true? Because usually that's where you see these flares, and and does that leave the door open for well maybe you're not done? Is there a subgroup that would benefit from getting these flares from peg interferon with a combination, and you might get what you or at least a better response? So that's that's my question. These these on treatment flares. Well, the first thing is that we saw on treatment affairs in both groups, right? Okay. We saw it with TDF as well. So you can get an on treatment flare with TDF. We all, sure. there were less of those and there were less moderate to severe uh, flares uh, or, you know, in terms of the severity, but well, we saw them with TDF as well. Yeah. So it's so not, it didn't matter. But, but I think Jay made the point earlier and I think it's, it's well taken in that, don't forget that during that first, you know, 24, 48, weeks when we're getting exposure to, and well, they're getting exposure during the first 24 weeks, but the first, that during that period is also when it's a lot of E antigen <laughs> a loss occurred as well, right? And, and whether, you know, whether it's only working um, in patients in terms of getting that E antigen serial conversion and that the flares related to that are really these effective flares, um, I think is yet to be seen. But the fact that they happen in the TDF group also, and um, suggests to me that Flares are telling us something, but it isn't only peg interferon that is the. But the flares are definitely less yeah. severe. Yeah, for sure, severe. less severe and less yeah. often. Yeah. So it does suggest it's, it's doing. I mean, I think we we all agree that it did something. 
Uh, <laughs> it did something. We, we saw higher yeah. rates of e-antigen loss. You can't, that's the most striking. Yeah. It doubled the rate of e-antigen loss, yeah. right? So it, it clearly had a, an effect. And then we know, of course, e-antigen loss was the, uh, also a marker for us in terms of getting s antigen loss. So, you know, along that pathway, it seems like picotinferon has a role. And, and I think that that's maybe one of the important messages. It's the e-antigen negative group, which has been the focus really for a lot of withdrawal studies where here we didn't see that interferon was, was helpful. And withdrawal wasn't helpful either, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also need to point out that with, there were some people with e-antigen who were withdrawn. And we rapidly learned that we yeah. mustn't do that because the first two patients developed life-threatening flare with jaundice. Yeah. One was actually evaluated for transplant. Interestingly, it wasn't very symptomatic, despite a bilirubin of 17. What we didn't have in the HBRN, and as mentioned before, we is a, a weakness, is we don't we didn't have fiber scan. And it would be very important to know after these flares, do people have kind of increased evidence of scarring and abnormality, stiffness to the liver. Yeah. Nora, I have just uh, uh, a brief comment. Do you think that it would be interesting to study the kinetics uh, of, uh, I mean, HBCG and see the difference during the um, flare that you have on treatment and the one uh, soon after when you do the withdrawal, because it's very important. I, I think it's very interesting. The fact that you have two kinds of flare, but one is positive, one is negative. Are you planning to do some more virological study to see if you have any predictive factor in terms of virology or anything? Because that's very interesting. Uh, I mean. Yeah, no, you, you make a good point. We've sort of separated them. We have two papers, right? One that's on, on treatment and one withdrawal. <laughs> You're asking us to compare them. That's it's. it's I mean, I would just yep. uh, okay. And, yeah, no, that's a great idea. Yeah, and if I can, I have just a little uh, question and comment for uh, Will uh, William Lee because uh, about to all is the e antigen positive, e antigen negative disease because I believe that there are two diseases. So usually, you know, Will in patients with uh, acute hepatitis B that seek medical advice the patients are e antigen positive. But in your case, you saw that uh, nearly 30% of your patients were hospitalized in the very early phase by e antigen negative. And the lack of e antigen was not due to a delay in the enrollment, at least according to the inclusion criteria. So we know that this is not a common finding in acute hepatitis B, but is uh, frequently detected in fulminant hepatitis B, where patients seek medical advice, HBCG antigen sometimes, I mean, e antibody positive, e antigen negative. So my question for you is, is there was any difference in the severity of acute hepatitis B between patients presenting as e antigen positive and e antigen negative? Because uh, it's pretty interesting, uh, the fact that you have such high rate during the very early phase of infection. Yes, I, I think we need to go back and look at that to see if there were any differences. On the, on the face of it, there wasn't anything obvious that, that stood out. But, but I, think, I think perhaps you're right. We, we need to just separate out that E negative group and look at them as a separate entity, were there any specific risk factor, or is there anything different about the E negative group from the E positive group? No, you should think that, the, you should think of chronic disease if, it, if they're E antigen positive, E antigen negative to begin with. E -antigen negative, but these right. didn't appear to be, it appeared to be early clearance of E. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We, but still it's, it's, uh, it's not a common finding because the clearance occurs always after. I mean, mm -hmm. the fire of hepatitis, so it's still, uh, Inter an interesting uh, finding that they present. Uh, but the with usual thing is that if you clear E antigen during acute hepatitis, you're going to re recover. You're going to clear S. Yeah, yeah, no, this for sure. They are all cleared about it. But I was just curious mm -hmm. about the kinetic. If there is, uh, if these are a different disease and is more severe than the. Uh, we should look. We should look at viral titers uh, on admission yeah. and that sort of thing. I think exactly. that's exactly. So this. Point. 
This also points out the maddening complexity of the serology of hepatitis B. It's absolutely maddening. <laughs> hepatitis C is so much easier. There's just one thing to look at here. There's E, there's anti-E. Let me tell you, the other problem we had was we had two ways of measuring E. It was either measured locally, it was qualitative, it's either positive or negative. And we had a central lab that did it uh, quantitatively. And unfortunately, there were differences. And um, we still haven't resolved them all, but there were some people who were positive by one and not by the other and vice versa. And of course, the disappearance of E was very dependent upon the method if it was one or the other. So it's this maddening complexity of the serology of hepatitis B that's, that's uh, so difficult. Right, Anna, you've had a long experience with this as well. <laughs> well, I mean, hepatitis B, you're right, because we have so many different markers and each marker can be measured using different ways. Um, and some of these markers we used to just have qualitative tests, positive, negative. Then we, particularly for service energy, we now understand that um, quantification is important. Um, part of it is um, it may reflect your immune control um, that um, because antiviral and all that doesn't necessarily suppress your S antigen. So when your S antigen level goes down in untreated patients, it may be your immune response is um, better able to control the virus. And with all the interest in um, achieving S antigen loss, everyone is um, saying that um, low surface antigen is the best predictor, but that's like, okay, if I can't feel your pulse, I can predict you're gonna have a cardiac arrest because the surface energy needs to keep going down to become undetectable. So in some ways is in the path of um, the surface energy clearance. Um, but I think that um, as we have more markers, some of the markers are gonna be important for us to understand whether the CCC DNA is less active or not. Um, and we know that with the NUPS, for example, TDF, you suppress the DNA, but the CCC DNA is still there, it's still um, active. Um, and that's right. when um, some of these new markers um, give us a better insight. And the loss of S antigen, which we feel like is such a good endpoint, it it's not always, doesn't always guarantee you that you won't develop a complication like HCC. I think what's important is cirrhosis. And as long as we see cirrhosis in patients with hepatitis B, our medical system has failed. We need to treat them before they get cirrhosis. Um, very important. And that goes to the issue of screening for surface antigen in the American population. Any proponents? <laughs> well, I think the CDC is, um, is preparing to come up with this recommendation. I don't know when exactly it's going to come out. Uh, it's like hep C, every adult, regardless of um, risk factors, gets screened one time. Because right. so many people don't recognize that they have risk factors. I mean, right. people have been exposed. People um, come from countries where hepatitis B is common. They don't remember that they have been exposed. Right. Now, the, the trouble with hepatitis C, we have a cure, right? They have a good treatment. With hepatitis B, it's difficult. As, as, as you show, some patients really don't need to be treated. And... Uh, that's that's the difficulty. It's not as simple as hepatitis C. Yeah, this I think has his um, hand up. Yeah, the no. CDC it, is it about is important to come to out. Know that your, your hepatitis B antigen positive, as far as your family members and as far as follow up, is is needed, even though you may not be able to be treated. Jay and the recent study also suggested that the major source of HBCG is the integrated HPV DNA. Yes. So getting even more complicated, especially for end point mm. of treatment. So I agree with you, very complex the serology of HPV. It keeps us busy. <laughs> yeah, I'll just make a comment that when the CDC is uh, I'm on that panel of of, a, of recommendations and it looks like uh, in the next couple of months, they're going to present their recommendations for universal screening for, H for HBV to their, uh, to their organization. And they, they, uh, they think the approval will actually come, come through in the fall. So by the fall, they will have made that. They've already made a recommendation uh, for universal vaccination. Uh, and then they'll, they'll uh, send that recommendation also to the U.S. Uh, 
services uh, health, uh, health uh, prevention uh, 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 group and get them to uh, endorse it in addition. Uh, and then I just, I agree with what uh, Patricia just said about HBSAG integration. I think those people are probably never gonna clear surface antigen um, if they've got integrated HBSAG. And we, we've we only got a couple studies that show that that occurs because it, the, the technique to, to show that currently is very, very difficult uh, and very time consuming. So we need a better way to, to, to find that. And if we can find that out, then we can uh, we can spare those those patients with uh, with uh, uh, you know we can we can decide who we're going to treat with antiviral therapy and uh, and who not and then the other problem that we have is at least in Alaska and I know in the U S is that the with NAFLD coming along about a third of our patients uh, with chronic HPV have NAFLD and um, many of them do not normalize their HP their ALT even though their HPV DNA goes below a thousand so. How do we account for NAFLD uh, co uh, coexistence with HBSCG? Uh, and then the other th problem, and I'm really glad that, that the network has started using, has, had used FibroScan, is uh, how, do we, in, in, uh, how do we find the incidence of cirrhosis in patients with, uh, and predict cirrhosis in patients with HPV, chronic HPV, uh, and the definition of what is cirrhosis without a liver biopsy. Uh, we need more data to come up with a better definition. Well, everybody's trying. Uh, it's very difficult to get to, to get a, a complete assurance, and it's going to be a little bit different for each liver disease. And it's, it's, it's quite complex, but FibroScan does make things easier. You can pick up cirrhosis in someone with normal enzymes, for instance. Um, or at least a suspicion that they have cirrhosis. Yeah, this will. I was just going to ask the other clinicians if there's if there's any criteria that you would use for withdrawal. Right now, my feeling is I'm not going to withdraw anybody based based on our study. Nora. Um. Well, I think there's some accumulate. I think Anna highlighted that, of course, the thing that predicts your ability to be withdrawn is having a very low surface antigen. So if I have a patient who has got a surface antigen level under 100, I would certainly talk about it. I, you have to have an adherent patient. They have to be motivated. So I would consider it in that patient with close follow-up. And then I think the additional data from our study where a rise in HPV DNA is really telling you that the patient is not only got, not going to clear surface antigen, but they could have an ALT flare has helped me because I'm going to use that as a tool to say, okay, you're going to go back on treatment. So I, I would do it in a very, very select number of patients. Fortunately, we have surface antigen quantitation available to us. And that is a new tool, I think, for us to try to think about stratification. And in my practice, the number that have a surface antigen level under 100 is quite low. So I, it's not a lot of patients who qualify. But if the question is whether you're stopping therapy because the patient doesn't want to pay for it or is tired of it and so forth versus trying to clear S. And I think the answer here is don't stop it in the hopes that it's going to help you clear S. But some people don't need to be on it. In fact, some people may have been put on it inappropriately. <laughs> I, we found that out several times. We've taken people off therapy who clearly didn't have criteria for treatment and, and they did fine. So some people can, can tolerate stopping therapy. And uh, we need to look more closely at our data, in fact, and it's still being looked at, uh, still being analyzed. Can we predict who will tolerate being off treatment, basically? Right. I mean, yeah, most most of these not. flares were asymptomatic. Most of them were asymptomatic. Yeah, I completely agree with Nora. I don't take patients off treatment because I'm doing it to increase the rate of S antigen loss. It's usually the patients come to me and say, I've been on treatment for so many years. Um, I don't really want to continue treatment um, any longer. Um, and in the older patients, I would usually say, no, 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 it's very high risk because the chance of having flares and decompensation is much higher in the older patients. In the younger patients, if they ask and they ask again, and I said, it's okay, let's just order quantitative S. If it's still very high, it's just not gonna happen. You're gonna just um, have um, recurrence and um, put back on treatment um, in a year or two. Um, but if they have um, low S energy, which like Nora, my experience is very rare, um, that I find someone who's really got a low enough um, surface antigen, then I'll say, okay, if you agree, 
monthly labs, so I keep an eye on you. And I also agree with Nora, in the past, we sort of wait until the ALT goes up. And we find that when we wait for the ALT to go up, it may be late. We should, um, as soon as we see the virus, some DNA keep going up. Even if the ALT is normal, that's the time to put a patient back on treatment. Right. Yeah, I, th well, I have, I have I another question here from the audience. Um, and it has to do with the acute hepatitis case with genotype A2. Are these patients uh, the ones who have delayed recovery or what can you say about that? No, no I don't think so. I think we need, we need to go back and look at it one more time, but I'm not aware that the A2s were the, were the delayed recovery patients. But you know, the, the fact that in Asia, hepatitis B is common chronically, whereas in Europe, it usually was not chronic. Could that have been a genotype difference? That the, in Europe, the common genotype was A2, and so most people recovered. Hmm. And yeah, the, also the genotype D is prom, pretty predominant in in the in Italy and and in Eastern Europe, and we found that the, those pa the outcome in those patients with uh, including HEC and, and including cirrhosis is is quite a bit lower than in genotype C uh, in the Alaska Native uh, population. Right. The other so thing to point out is in hepatitis B. <laughs> I was just going to say the other thing to point out is that I've had several who become S antigen negative, let's say after I've been caring for them for a number of years, but they're still, they still are, have a cult HBV DNA. They still have 500 IU or 300 IU. Um, and that, that's a, another quandary. For, do, do, if they have cirrhosis, I certainly would keep them on treatment, even if they're S antigen negative, I guess, if they have a viral load return. Uh, but, but some, some of them will just, ride along with a uh, viral load of, of 500 IU for, for a long time, uh, S antigen negative, not on treatment. I found that they eventually will go away, but uh, maybe not, mm. just too few. Nora, do you want to address those issues? Uh, I, I have a very a low number of such patients, but I've seen them as well. I, I agree with you 100%. If they have advanced fibrosis, they're on treatment. I think virus is just not a good thing for those patients, so I would treat. Even Otherwise, if they clear surface antigen? Even if they've cleared surface antigen. If they've got persistent viremia that I'm detecting at low level, I would treat that, yes. So, so in the HBRN, there was one person who cleared surface antigen that had cirrhosis and was not withdrawn. So you would leave that patient on? I would. I, I think, you know, I feel like if the virus there is still probably driving some risk, um, whether it, especially for HCC would be my concern. So I would, I would suppress that patient. Well, I would, if you wanted to take them off, I would be very careful. And yeah, follow them very oh, I, well, I think that's very one thing about the oh, HBRN. They did a great job of following this withdrawn patients being seen every month. I don't think there was a single patient we lost. Yeah, it points uh, toward they were the off medication. Therapy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hard work. So any, uh, any other comments? Have we run out of time? Almost. I just want to highlight one thing that Bob Perillo. So thanks, Bob, for for chiming in here. So Bob Perillo is the is the lead on the paper related to the ALT flares during treatment, and he had a comment to the chat that said that they, and you know, this is something where he's got the the details. He said they looked at the flares by E antigen status, and it didn't always correlate. Didn't find that that was an association that the ALT flares were related to the E antigen loss. So implying that there's sort of more to it in terms of the flare. I'm going to just read. Well, it's, it's the yeah. drop of surface antigen with E antigen loss, you see. That's why it's confounded. Yeah, there, there was it's not, it's difficult, you know, to tease out these things, right. I think. With the PEG interferon yeah. uh, treatment, there was the loss of E and, and S occurred together within a month or two of each other. So you couldn't kind of separate out whether it's with the clearance of S or the clearance of E. It's very complex, like everything in hepatitis B. <laughs> well, I'm sure we've confused our audience completely, John. Oh, hopefully we've inspired <laughs> them. Not. To that means you the challenge the of this no, no, that's not, that's Further not. studies are needed. <laughs> no, and on a negative note, I think it raises a lot of uh, questions. It uh, shows a lot of uh, findings from the uh, network and um, 
you know, some of the uh, implications for generalizability of uh, treatment, the continued value of genotype testing and e-antigen testing. And as we have an increasing call for simplification, how do we reconcile that call with the data such as this coming from the network? I think it's a big challenge. The other big takeaway is that we need network studies of this type in other parts of the world, such as in Africa, where the genotypes are different right. and the, this type of study hasn't been um, conducted to really, uh, to really <laughs> promote generalizability of um, recommendations. Um, I'm sure there are many others um, that come to mind. And so maybe we should have another webinar in the future to, to continue to explore this. I look forward to that. So thank you all for this. I know we've, we've reached a full two hours. I, I found it very thought provoking all along the way. Hope others agree. Uh, please fill out the evaluation that was up on your screen a moment ago um, and look forward to uh, future opportunities to work with, with, together with all the colleagues uh, on the call today. Thank you again for joining. Um, and um, uh, please uh, sign up for the webinars as we'll be having a, another um, 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 a number of other webinars uh, for NIH research um, uh, um, throughout uh, 2023. Uh, thanks again, all, and I look forward to working with you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. guys. Very good. That's um, Hi, Nora. Uh, more questions to follow. Bye-bye. I got it. Bye. Bye-bye.